Today, we are in week five of a series we're calling Cuffin' Season. Let's give God some praise today. And um, five has a special place in my heart because five is the number of grace. <laughs> and this is the fifth month of the year. And this is the fifth uh, message in this series. And actually, somebody else was supposed to preach today. And we've been in such a flow. The Holy Spirit said, don't you dare step out your spot. I was like, Lord, we had planned this. You know, rest, <laughs> relaxation. He said, you're going on sabbatical in about a month and a half, but I need you to finish the assignment I've given you. I need you to preach today. And so literally I called PC last Sunday. I was like, dog, I'm up again. He said, what about? I said, uh-uh. The Holy Spirit then changed the plans and he's given me a direct message on what to preach about. And I said, he said, what is it? I said, well, let me tell you this message. I, I, I know there's thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people that send Transformation Church and myself um, direct messages and telling how, how much the sermon series are blessing them or asking questions or trying to see if I can marry you. The answer is no, I can't marry y'all. I'm so sorry. I can't do everybody's wedding. But I just wanted to address it all together. <laughs> um, but sometimes the Lord leads me to the DMs to, to find out what's resonating and what people are hearing and seeing from these messages. Since we haven't been able to meet in person in almost two and a half years. And let me just say, the day is soon approaching. Oh, it's closer than you think. When we open up, we having a party for five weeks straight. I don't care. Get ready. Everybody get ready. It's going to be a homecoming. I don't care what month it's in. We're going to have a band. I'm going to wear, I'm going to be my daddy. I'm going to be a drum major. I'm going to back band. I'm going to do something. But since we have not been open, uh, one of the things I do is I feed off of people. I can look in people's eyes and see what's going on. I, I talk to people. I hug people. And since I haven't been able to do that, I, I'm, God has given me instructions to, to look when he tells me to look. And literally, I opened up my Instagram and the young lady, she said this. She said, Pastor Mike, the messages have impacted my life so much over the last three weeks. I, I don't know even how to express it. She said, but I have a problem. It's true. I've been cuffed to comfort. I've been cuffed to convenience. And I've been cuffed to comparison. And for the first time in my life at her age, I'm admitting it. I've seen it, but I've never admitted it. And today I'm admitting it. And I can't help but tell you that instead of feeling joy, I feel condemnation. What do you do when the truth of where you actually are makes you feel more defeated and want you to go back to what was comfortable? Okay. And at that moment, the Holy Spirit said, that's the message. He said, today I need you to break the cycle of condemnation over my people because they have been cuffed to condemnation. And see, this is one of those that you may not suspect, but even after you come into the knowledge of who Jesus Christ is and you being who you are in connection with him, the enemy can try to play you on what you used to do and how you used to be and where you should be. And if you wouldn't have made that mistake, you would be so much further. And if you wouldn't have gone to that website, if you wouldn't have met those people and if you wouldn't have married that person. And if you would have just been there when your child was abused. Oh, come on. I'm, I'm coming for real stuff today. If you wouldn't have met that person your whole life. And what the enemy tries to do is cave you in to isolation. Through this spirit of condemnation. And many of you have been cuffed to it. When God speaks directly to you that you're going to do something, you can't accept it. Because of the spirit of condemnation. Well, what if they really find out who I am? What if they find out that every Thursday I still got to hit a drink? What if they find out that last month I was 
sleeping with such. What if they find out that I still owe taxes from five years ago? What if they find out? Y'all hear how silent it is in the building? Because the spirit of condemnation has come to rob you of your life in Christ. And today, I'm about to be ignorant. I'm not playing with this spirit because it's robbed so many of you of the freedom that is now yours as a believer of Jesus Christ. But you have been so cuffed to condemnation that you're walking around ball and chain. God's calling you to do great things. You can't even see it for yourself. He's put you in a land of prosperity, but you still remember when you were in a land of desert. God has brought you around relationships you prayed for, but you can't even lean into them because you're remembering all the people who left you. God is coming to free you from condemnation condemnation today I need somebody to give God praise and faith today even if you can't see it yet today God's word is going to uncuff you from condemnation oh this is about to be good um um I, I've realized um that too many of God's children have a life in Christ but they're living condemned so 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 I need to let you know what condemnation means Write this down. Definition of condemnation. It's a sentence to punishment. You did it so you will be punished for this forever. You had a baby out of wedlock. You will wear that for the rest of your life. Don't celebrate them fully. Don't, don't, don't be proud of it. Don't, 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 no, 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 no. It wasn't an event. It's your identity. That's what the spirit of condemnation comes to do is turn events into identity. Yes, it happened. That's not who I am. Yes, I did it. That's not who I am. Yes, I've repeatedly done it, but that is not who I am. You don't know me. But the truth of the matter is I said it, but you don't believe it. And we put this sentence of punishment on our lives after we come to Christ that somehow we think he's making us carry. You're the kid who put yourself in timeout. Why? When... It's found out or you confess that you did it. You go to punish yourself. And you didn't even listen to what the authority said about you. Wow. It's because the spirit of condemnation has you thinking that God is a punisher. I know. I know you was raised in that church. I know you was raised where it was hell, brimstone, fire. Going to hell. <laughs> Going to hell. Skirts, hell. Lipstick, hell. Watches, hell. Food, hell. Nah, we eat food. Uh-huh. I'm going to do a message on gluttony next week. But, 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 but what happens is we don't realize that God is not a pu punisher. He doesn't punish. He disciplines. There is a difference. Punishment has negative emotion involved. That's why when you see the person at the line in the store and their kids are curious and they put a million candies in front of them at the checkout line at eye level, you don't think that's on purpose? But I told that little, before we came in the store, don't touch nothing. You took them into a store with 10,000 items. At age seven and you really expecting them not to touch nothing what happens if they touch it I'm a put that down little day day you ain't going you know we ain't got money for that you ain't gonna embarrass me in the store and you pop them you punish them cuz emotionally it was charged by your fear of being embarrassed a emotionally mature adult can be able to tell them, sweetheart, 
we're not getting that. Mommy already asked you one time. Please put that down. But if you do your chores, maybe next time you can, you're, dis, you're teaching them something. But when you pop them and now they're crying in the store and then you say, shut up before I give you something to, oh, oh. Oh, you know. What do you think it taught them? It taught them to do what Adam and Eve did. Hide. And so now we have a culture that's hiding from authority. Because we think that all authority is going to lay punishment on us instead of give us discipline. And so that spirit of condemnation says hide everything. Stay undercover. Do it when nobody's listening. Because if you get found out, you're going to have a sentence to punishment. Rest of the definition. Or to pass judgment against. To pronounce to be guilty. If you do it, you're guilty. And the enemy uses this. Because we're in this flesh suit, do you know the real you is not even this body? Do you know the realest version of you is your spirit? Some of y'all spirits real weak. Some, some of your flesh is way stronger, but the realest, the version of you that will outlast this body is your spirit. And what the enemy tries to make you feel is what you do in this body is more important than what you do in the spirit. Okay, this is going to take a lot. So the enemy uses all of our mistakes, missteps, and our mishaps to keep us in condemnation. He uses what we do in our humanity to sum up our identity. So, so let me put it in a point because we're going to have to journey. In Christ, sinning is a symptom of humanity, not our identity. As long as you're in this earth suit, you will sin. Now, there's a difference between actively sinning and trying to do it all the time and just wilding out or making a mistake or how the Bible defines sin, missing the mark. I missed the mark. I missed the mark. I was supposed to not lie. Dang it, I lied to them. Missed the mark. I was scared that it was going to cost me something, so I just uh, did what my flesh felt. I missed the mark. You're going to miss the mark every day you breathe. It's a symptom of humanity. But it is not your identity. Okay, I just got it. This is the stuff nobody told me. So when I was in my bedroom and, 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 I, and I masturbated and I watched pornography and I did this stuff, it made me feel like nothing for a month. Because I was what I did oh y'all don't want to be real it, it it affected how I enjoyed life it affected how it, it, and, and I'm not saying oh because somebody I can hear something you're you giving people a license to sin don't nobody need a license to sin <laughs> who whoever needed a license to sin they doing it they, they you did uh. No, no, no. I'm trying to explain to you what the enemy uses to keep you in that condemnation cycle that makes you go back to sin. Yeah, that's it. The longer you sit in your filth, you become immune to the smell. I'm trying to pull you into fresh air, the pneuma, the life, the spirit of God, so you can have freedom. So when you fall in, you like, oh, I got to get this off me. Uh, no, 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 no. I messed up. Oh, 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 oh. I got a shower. Got a shower. But the longer you sit in it, <laughs> e, okay. So in Christ. Now, notice I'm saying in Christ, yeah, yeah, yeah. Be because you, you have to put your faith in your life in Christ. That's what I was talking about for everybody who just gave their life to Christ at, at, at the before sermon salvation. I like that. What ended up happening to you is you put your life in Christ. And now you've become a new creation. 
The old has passed away. I'm going to show you the scripture. And behold, it, everything becomes new. So now your eternity is secure. But your history has to be sanctified. So, so where I'm going is already settled. But why would you be living your whole life to get to heaven and live in hell? I'm walking heavy today. I just, and, and so today I just need you to know that in Christ, somebody say in Christ. in Christ. Say it like you mean it, in Christ. In Christ. I failed, but I'm not a failure. Yeah. Somebody say in Christ. in Christ. In Christ I messed up, but I'm not a mistake. Yeah. Somebody say in Christ. in Christ. In Christ I lost, but I'm not a loser. <laughs> somebody say in Christ. in Christ. In Christ I cheated, but I'm not a cheater. Uh-oh, I'm coming against culture. Once a cheater. According to who? Because in, <laughs> in Christ, you may not be able to give me another chance. You may not be able to forgive me. You may not be able to look beyond my faults and see my need and see that that actually came from a trauma that was trying to be covered and salved through something I didn't have the tools to do. But yeah, I cheated. But I'm not a cheater. Yeah, Pastor Mike, how do you know? Because it was me. Oh, you want to be real? <laughs> be before, see, I know this is a story no pastors tells you because they want to let you know that they've been great all their life. The devil is a liar. Before me and Pastor Natalie met when I was 15 and she was 14, the greatest gift that God ever gave me was my wife. And what ended up happening was I started listening to culture about three years later when I was about to graduate from high school. And I started exploring different relationships because I heard this one dude, I wish I could sock him in his face right now. <laughs> but, but I didn't know. I didn't know. And he was like, bro, how are you going to just settle down with her and you ain't never experienced nothing else? Don't that sound like the enemy yeah. in the garden to Adam and Eve? Yeah. I ain't know enough Bible then. I couldn't call it out. So I was like. Duh, duh, duh. <laughs> Started exploring stuff, broke her heart, sent her into another relationship that, that, that was not good for her. Went down a spiral, opened up things. We both lost our virginity. We going through all of these cycles. Now we back together, but don't trust each other and trying to move and act like we do. And all of these different triggers and traumas and all of these different things. In the meantime, just standing here like God is going to bring us back together. Ain't talking to nobody, no, not a part of no community group, trying to figure out how to navigate life. And all they telling me on Sunday, is this going to be all right? How? So I need some hows. I'll pay an extra hundred for how? <laughs> Give me, a, come on, somebody, does anybody when you tell, how? And we struggling, going through all type of stuff. And there was one moment in that season where I could not see myself out from under the cloud of condemnation. Because I knew everything I was suffering at that moment was because of decisions I made and the enemy was in the corner hyping me up. That's right. You here and you stuck. You might as well leave her. She's never going to trust you. You're going to always have to side hug everybody for the rest of your life. <laughs> oh, these are real. Y'all don't... <laughs> She always going to call and ask, who's there? See, these are the real things. She, yo, she ain't never going to let you in. She ain't never going to. And the enemy is just literally to the point where almost, almost like I'm, I messed up so bad, I might as well walk away from the gift God gave me. The spirit of condemnation, condemnation almost made me forfeit the greatest tool God has used to grow me. The truth of the matter is I cheated, but I, in Christ, am not a cheater. It's been over 15 years, 20 years almost, since the incident happened. But 15 almost of those years, I let the cloud of condemnation still stay over me. 
See, I couldn't even share this with you because I would be concerned about how you would view me. Can I tell you today? I don't care. Because I have been made free in Christ. Oh, I need somebody to hear me. I was cuffed to condemnation, but your boy is free now. And today I want to offer you the same level of freedom. Because the enemy will try to convince you that's who you are. Look what the Bible says in John 3, 17. For God did not send his son Jesus into the world to condemn the world. Out of everything, the reason why, and I know churches have told you, you're condemned for that. But God did not sin. Y'all know what this is in the Bible? This is right after the most famous scripture that everybody got tattooed on their chest. John 3, 16, say it with me. For God so loved the world, you ain't been to church in a year, that he gave his only begotten son. You don't know where it is. And like, who shall ever believe it to him shall not perish, but have everlasting. That's John 3, 16. John 3, 17. For God did not send his son in the world to condemn it. This is the one we need to remember. He didn't come to condemn the world. I know, I know those people came to condemn the world. But everybody you hate, God loves. I'm going to say it again. Every single person that you're opposed to politically, God loves them. Everybody that's in a def different sexual orientation, God loves them. What I'm telling you is I'm going to step on your opinion right now. But when God came to the world, he saw all of the mess we would all be in. And he said, I came to save you, not condemn you. Okay. The religious people just logged off. Here we go. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the Christians... The, so that in order that the people who are my same skin color, the world might be saved through not church, not religious activities, through Christ. That's why everything we do at this church is for the lost and found, but for one reason, transformation in not Michael Todd. I don't want you to look at me as a savior. I'm a tool to point you to the savior. This is transformation in Christ. And until you get that, the enemy will be able to play you because the people you look up to when their humanity is exposed, you think somehow God fell off the throne because they did. Okay. First John... <laughs> Go to 1 John chapter 3, verse 20, and I'm going to give you a point real quick. God, God's whole concentration was sending Jesus for salvation to destroy condemnation. I'm going to say it one more time. God's whole concentration, the reason he made this plan after we messed it up in the garden, his whole concent concentration was sending Jesus for salvation to destroy what? Condemnation. 1 John 3.20, for whenever our heart condemns us, now we know where condemnation starts. Condemnation starts in the heart. So, so that means I don't even need a group of people to feel condemned. That means it can happen at any moment. And it says, for whenever our heart condemns us, God is, I love this one, greater. He's greater than our heart. And he knows everything. This gives me so much comfort because even the stuff I ain't told y'all, he know all of it. And he's still greater than everything that has tried to condemn me in my heart. For some of y'all, that should be a praise break. Because if we all knew what, who you really are and the hard drives of crap that you got. Okay. <laughs> and the skeletons you have buried in the middle of Nevada. And, 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 and all of the things that have happened, not even in your actions, but in your mind and in your heart. And God said, I know all of that. And I still choose you. And watch this. He's so good. And I'm still going to give you a calling. I'm going to look beyond all of the crap and give you a calling. 
And I came to let somebody know that condemnation is not greater than your calling. I need somebody to hear me say that, that everything that has tried to condemn you, everything that you actually did, everything that you allowed to happen to you, it is not bigger than God's calling for your life. And I'm speaking to the depths of your soul who have been believing that God no longer will use you because of what you did. And I came to tell you that God's position did not change in the universe because you messed up. It honestly makes him bigger that he could take somebody as jacked up and as messed up as me and you. And he can still give you a calling and lift you up out of that place of darkness. I'm telling you right now, his strength is made perfect in my weakness. That's why if I'm going to boast, it's in the most high God. Y'all hear me? What I'm telling you is the spirit of condemnation comes to make you think that somehow that the calling of God on your life is void. And I'm coming to speak to that thing that has had you paralyzed for a decade. Because you had the abortion. And now it's a hot topic everywhere. And every time you see a post, you dare not tell anybody that in a season of your life where you didn't have the emotional tools and the people around you to make a sound decision, you decided to abort a baby and now it was not an event, it's your identity. You don't stand comfortable and confident when people are talking about situations because you feel like you're defined by that moment. And today I came to tell you that God still has a call for you. Even if you had an abortion God still has a call for you even if you messed over the opportunity that was supposed to take you from here to there God still has a call for you if you went through bankruptcy and you no longer have the clout you used to have God still has a call for you he's not in the clout he's in the callings whatever you have been given by God it's still valid But if the spirit of condemnation is what rules over you, you'll never accept what's already available. Oh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 11. (laughs) The reason I got to preach this today, because I need you to stop getting played by the enemy. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 2 11, it says, in order that Satan might not outwit us. That means he's trying to play you every day. He's trying to scheme on you. He's trying to make you think that you're better than you are. Oh, girl, I'm 60 years old. I don't deal with that no more. Shut up. You just older in dysfunction. You, you haven't, you haven't, what are, what are adults, older kids with more responsibility? What are you talking about? You still complain. You still compare. You still do all that. What are you talking about? You just have a mortgage. If you don't allow God. No, I'm serious because we do this stuff and I'm like, I'm grown. That's a worse testimony to still have that attitude and be grown. You still grown and can't look beyond somebody's fault in Sydney? You, you grown and you can't love people beyond your offense? You, talk to me, you grown? That's arrogance. As long as you're on this earth, you will still be learning. You will still be going. You will still be going. And that's why I'm saying to you right now that that you still need to know the enemy's plan for you at 65, at 70, at 75. Just because you're a seasoned saint, you don't think he won't make some of y'all fall into temptation? You think it don't matter no more because you've lived for seven decades? Okay, let me stop. It says in order that Satan might not outwit us, For we are not unaware of his schemes. I want to know what my opponent about to do. If I'm playing a game and somebody that used to play for the team comes over and said, I know exactly what they about to run. It gives us the, everybody say, advantage to be able to go onto that court or that field and be able to defeat the uh, opponent. Well, we also have an advantage. His name is the Holy Spirit. He's our advantage. And when we know the things that the enemy is trying to do by God's word and the understanding of the Holy Spirit, then we get an advantage. And today I want to give you an advantage 
as we break the spirit of condemnation. And I, I, God gave me this really cool way to illustrate it. He said, Michael, my people are in the cycle of condemnation. It's a cycle. It's cyclic. It happens over and over. Y'all know. Every two years. How you move from L.A. to New York to Dubai. And every two years. There's a relationship that takes you out. How in the world have you gone to four different jobs, but you find the same people at every job? How come you get to this level in your schooling and this time of the year and then anxiety and depression hits you? Because you didn't get an A on that. It's the cycle. Of condemnation and the enemy is playing God's people and today I, I need to break it so we're gonna look at somebody's life who, who experienced everything from the calling to condemnation and his name is Peter and and, and, and Peter is one of those people that I really identify with because I feel like I like the gangster that Peter has I like the understanding of like Jesus I'm down for you but then like like there's a lot of nuances that I can see in me that were in him and so I want us to walk with him from Luke chapter 5 verse 1 and, and, and let me give you perspective Peter's out living in culture doing what he normally does and he has this encounter with Jesus it says when he had finished speaking this is Jesus because because he was speaking and there were so many people that came up that he was like hold on I need a boat and he gets in Peter's boat and he says push out and he's in his boat and he says push out into the deep water let down your nets for some fish Simon said to him and this is Simon Peter okay he said to him um teacher we worked all night and we have caught nothing but because you told us to, because you said so, somebody say, say so, because you said so, I'm going to do it. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets started to break. That's a whole sermon in itself. I can't stay there. But it says they called to their other friends in the working boats to come and help them. They came and both boats, this is what I want you to see, were so full with the miracle they began to sink. Watch this. When Simon Peter saw the grace of God, it doesn't say that right there, but Peter did nothing to earn that type of miracle. He literally was doing it one way. It didn't work. He obeyed Jesus. He did it and it worked so much that he didn't know how to handle it. When Simon Peter saw this grace, he got down at the feet of Jesus and he said, now, this is not my response to the biggest day in my business history. Like, like, think about that's like you being an entrepreneur and you having a million dollar day. Watch his response. Go away from me, Lord, because I'm a sinful man. Right there, something Peter had done in his past. When he experienced the grace of God could not accept it. And that was the seed of condemnation. Did y'all see it? He and all those with him were surprised and wondered about the many fish. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were surprised also. Everybody was tripping. They were working together with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. The same thing he tells you with all of your past. Do not be afraid. From now on, you will fish for men. When they came to the land with their boats, they left everything and followed Jesus. I need to let you know, condemnation, the cycle of condemnation, never starts off bad. It starts off with a calling. <laughs> Put the cycle of, of condemnation up here because I'm, I'm going to have to help them. Like, the first thing God is going to do is give you a calling. He said, I'm going to show you my grace. I'm going to overwhelm you with it. And then I'm going to call you out of that season you were in of fishing. And I'm going to give you something else that's not going to negate your skills there. He said, I'm going to make you fishers of men. I'm not going to take away your skill. I'm just going to change your lake. I'm not asking you to become a different person. I want to use everything you did there 
And I want to give you a calling that advances my kingdom. Oh, my God. So Peter is called. But he's called by someone specific. Can I tell you something? Your parents can't give you a calling. They will try to direct your calling. But callings do not come from parents. Callings do not come from entrepreneur CEOs. Callings don't come from, watch this, college. Some of y'all go to college to try to find your calling. That's not where callings come from. Callings come from one place. Put it up there. When you're called, no, 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 no. Put the Lord under called. When, you, when you're called, your calling comes from the Lord. Okay? No, no, no. Yeah, go ahead and put the whole thing up there. I'll walk through it. Um, sidebar on this scripture right here. Um, when they put the, the nets out there, what they was doing, what they was regularly, commonly doing, it didn't work. When they did what God said to do, it worked. Yeah. Write this down on a point. This is a sidebar. I don't know who it's for. It may be for you. Your common without Christ is an empty catch. Everything you do commonly without him, you'll never get anything that nourishes anybody else. If you keep, go, go ahead, do your little blog, do your little podcast, do, 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 do your little fashion, do, do, do your business, do it without Christ. It'll never be something that sustains you. There will be no sustenance in it. You will just keep doing it and it'll be an empty catch. But ask God to come in. Hit a Proverbs 3, 5. Acknowledge him in all your ways and watch him direct your path. Watch the catch be able to bless so many people that you have to call haters and competition. To get some of this, because God's been so good. Sidebar. After this moment, Peter starts following Jesus. And this is where Peter becomes, everybody say committed. Because the first thing you will have is a calling. You'll be called by the Lord. But then you have to be, everybody say committed. And let me tell you something nobody told me. Commitment is learned. You don't, you don't wake up committed to nothing. And, and I don't know why y'all act like somehow if it's a struggle sometimes or you have to do it over and over again or if you have to develop the pattern of it, somehow it's not real. No, 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 no. I'm just learning. Right now, as my son MJ is beginning to learn to say words, let me say it again. As my son MJ is learning to say words, that's a miracle around these parts. As this miracle in motion is unfolding, his teacher has to go over and over with him the same thing. Why? Not because he don't want to learn. He's committed to learning. He got to sit down every day and do it. But sometimes you got to continue to practice what you want to be permanent. And in church, we don't talk about this. We act like you get saved and now you're committed to Christ. Jesus Christ. We, <laughs> we act like we're supposed to step into every situation and have all the answers and no, 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 I'm turning the other cheek. And no, I'm learning. Don't catch me on the wrong day because I'm still learning how to be committed to Christ. Don't you go to that church? I do, but I ain't the pastor. <laughs> I don't want to give you permission after you've been called by God to learn how to be committed. Every day I'm learning how to be committed to my wife. It's a decision I've made, but it's a practice that I have to display every day. And so it's the same thing when it comes to God. And, and, and Peter then goes into this season of being committed. Peter was like that gangster committer. He might have been the first one to say, Jesus Christ, that he might have been. <laughs> the reason I think that is because when they were in the Garden of Gethsemane, he had learned by walking with Jesus to be so committed that he got real zealous. That when they came to arrest Jesus, and Jesus already told him it was going to happen. He's like, Peter, chill. They coming. This must be done. Not, not on the set, Jesus. I bet, I bet you I wish they would come up off in here, and he was just standing there like this. 
If you in the hood and anybody standing like this, go the other way. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do not mess with them. He was so committed when they came up, my man was like on site. Some of y'all, Becky on site? What does that mean? Is that a, a construction environment? No. Like if somebody says on site, it means we're not talking. When I see you, That's that Michael Jackson. <laughs> Peter sees the dudes trying to come at Jesus. No words, pulls out a shank, shrink, cuts off my man's ear. Jesus in the back like, oh my God. But, but, but Peter's passion was fueled by his commitment. One thing I can work with, uh, this is for every CEO. I can work with somebody who committed enough to be passionate. Like, 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 don't just find somebody who has the competency. Find somebody who's committed. Peter was committed and Jesus was like, I know you come. Let me help you with the ear. Uh, picks it up. Boop. Puts it back on. Peter probably got somebody back, like, hold me back, fool, hold me back. And he's ready to do it. He's like, Peter, I told you this, this had to happen. But the thing that I take from this is Peter was committed. The first instruction was follow. And his learned commitment turned into a fight. Sometimes it's just going to be a step. I don't really know what I'm doing. I don't even know if this is going to work. But we walk by faith and not by sight. Peter had learned to walk with Jesus and be committed so much that what was a simple follow turned in something that he would fight for. What I'm asking you is what are you following that you're willing to fight for? He got committed. And you can go look that up in Luke 24. And so what ends up happening is... Um, I, I, I want to just say it in a point, commitment to Christ is learned. Yeah. Just so that, like, you're going to have to develop this. Give yourself grace. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. but you have the cloud of condemnation over you. So every time you mess up, there's no grace for that. You know how we know? It's because of how you judge other people when they mess up. Yeah. The most judgmental people... That is a mirror of how they actually feel about themselves. I can't believe that these celebrities, and if I was, you'll never be. That's why you behind the screen commenting on what everybody else is doing and have done nothing great enough to even be commented on. Your family don't even text you about your stuff. <laughs> Let me stop. What I'm saying to you is because of the spirit of condemnation, you would rather be judgmental and critical. We need to do that one, cuff to critical. Critical. you rather be critical of people and not celebrate them, but it's honestly the mirror that you're reflecting on others that you actually believe about yourself. And so when you started your Bible reading plan and you made it six days on a streak, and miss the seventh one? You stopped the whole plan? You ain't even going back to the plan because you were more to, you were more committed to the streak than the scriptures. You wanted to be perfect in your performance instead of actually get the power of the scriptures. Oh my God. And so what ends up happening so many times is because we won't give ourselves grace to mess up and start again and to try. And you know what? That didn't really work out. Tried this business and work. We won't give ourselves the grace. Then we judge other people with that same spirit. Yep. <laughs> and all God is saying is commitment is learned. And let me say this to you because this is something I've learned in the last dec decade. Discipline turns into a desire. Discipline never starts out as a desire. Nobody's like, yes, let me do things I hate. 
Let me start off my day with the things that make me feel small, little, and incompetent. (laughs) No. Anything I have to be disciplined at is because it's hard to do for me. You know what is not hard for me to do? Eat ice cream. It's never been hard to get a pint of Blue Bell. Just run through it. Mad if somebody else want to bite. Never been hard. You know what's been difficult for me? Not pulling up at Quick Trip. Like, I ain't been to Quick Trip in like four months. That's the best gas station here in Oklahoma. It, like, I used to go to Quick Trip. I got an electric car. Why am I at Quick Trip? <laughs> like, like, I don't need gas. <laughs> but I was... <laughs> can I just tell on myself, I plug my car up, I don't use the, 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 the petrol. <laughs> Quick Trip every day. Grabbing things that reinforce my comfort. Things that I ran to in middle school. Starburst? What? A stick of Starburst? I can, ah, oh, I can hit the whole thing. Color combinations? With a Sprite? Oh, the magic in my mouth. Y'all gonna act fake up here. Gummy worms? Trolleys? Have y'all tried the new Fruit Punch jump off? My security brought me some of those. I almost fired him. So good. What I'm saying is, even though I'm 35, I always go back to my default of comfort. Specifically when I'm under the cloud of condemnation. When I don't feel good enough, I just want to feel good. When I don't feel worthy, I'm going to make myself feel worth it. You know what I'm saying? And this is how we find ourselves in a lot of positions. Because we didn't commit to being disciplined until it turned into a desire. This morning, me and Pastor Charles was working out. And our, uh, our trainer um, I got possessed by the devil, I think. And said, today... We're doing Mike Tyson push-ups. I didn't know exactly what that meant, but I I knew it wasn't good. And so I've learned the reason I need a trainer is because I will not be disciplined if I have to decide what I'm doing. See, some of y'all are in such a leadership position that you'll never get somebody over you. I pay this person, but I pay him to tell me what to do. The the art of mentoring and the art of being trained should be at every level of your life. Every level. I don't care if you're the CEO. Somebody should be telling you what to do in specific areas. Because I got to be disciplined. This man, Charles, come here. Let's show him what we did this morning. Y'all. Now, I don't know. I ain't never done it in a suit. We still walking sideways. Okay. Come on. Let's get down here. Come on. Are y'all ready? We can get at least how many? Four? <laughs> Four more, maybe five. So he made us put our, uh, our thing up here, lean up, do a push-up, and then come back in this crouch position. And, and the whole time I was thinking, this is dumb. I shouldn't be doing this. Mike, you're a grown man. Get off the floor. And the coach said, if you want to see the results, these are the type of things you got to do. So me and Charles, guess what we did? You ready? Let's go. One. Uh, two. Uh, three. Uh, four. Oh, I got a million. I got a million. But listen, listen. Oh God, brother! I, no, he said three more. No, you do it. You do it. Okay. No, no, no. Watch, Charles. I don't know about you, but if if on the platform was the first time we had done that, 
that would have been a lot more difficult. But because in the dark at 630 this morning, we were being disciplined. When we got on the platform, even what I thought would be harder was actually easy. I said four, we did six. And if we had to, like if my kids' lives depended on it, that's the only reason. All of our kids, all 10 of them, as many kids as y'all have. Uh, I'd be pregnant right now. I don't even know. I don't even know. That baby just keep popping them out. Really? Woo! But, but we could have done more. Because we've committed to discipline until it turns into a what? Desire. Okay. Okay. So, so, so uh, let me give you this next level uh, of the cycle of condemnation. You get called, then you're committed, and then you get confronted. Life, as long as you live life, whatever you're committed to will be confronted. See, in Peter's life, when they take Jesus from the garden after he gets uh, plastic, gives plastic surgery to the soldier and Jesus fixes it, then they take Jesus away to be tr tried. And this is the events that happen right before Jesus is crucified. Let me tell you this point because some of y'all are really committed to Christ until you get confronted. You talk about, I love everybody until somebody that's hard to love, God puts right in front of you. You talk about how generous you are until the first and the 15th. <laughs> see, see, I don't care who you are. Life is going to come to everybody say, confront me. At some point, your commitment is going to be confronted. And, 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 and you, say, you, you, you say you're humble. Get ready. Your humility is going to be, everybody say, confronted. This is life. I don't care how much you pray. I don't care how much you give. I don't care how many scriptures you know. Whatever you are committed to will be confronted by life. I'm a man of crazy faith. I have a son with autism. You have faith? Really believe God? Let's see. Why in the world would this happen? We live in a fallen world. And there are certain things we can't control, but we can respond. And, 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 and when Peter gets confronted, something happens that I don't know if too many of us would be far away from the reaction that Peter had. It says Luke chapter 24, verse 54. I'm just trying to show you the cycle so we can break it, so we can get uncuffed. Then they seized him, that's Jesus, and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following, watch this, at a distance. Ooh, be careful how much distance you put between you and Jesus. Three seconds before, he was so committed, he cut off the ear. But as soon as consequences came, he started walking at a distance. Be careful when you start claiming Jesus in 2022 and people start giving you consequences, start judging you. Do you become quiet about your faith now? Are you still unashamed? 116, are you still? Because Peter started following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Hold on. Somebody who was that close and with him everywhere was able to blend in with everybody else now? Okay. Then a servant girl, seeing him when he got into the light, she looked closely and was like, <sighs> look, 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 this man also was with him, but he denied it. Now he was just committed to cut off the ear, 
but, but now the consequences has come. He's been confronted with his calling and his commitment. Now he denied it, saying, woman, shut up. I don't know him. It reminds me of that meme that says, I, I hate to say it. I hope I don't sound ridiculous. I don't know who this man is. He could be walking down the street. I wouldn't know a thing. I'm sorry to this man. He, he denied Jesus openly, but walk with him privately. Okay. Some of y'all so ready to pray on the prayer line. But we'll not invite your boss to your church. Because you know what they do. That's exactly why you should be the hands and feet. Oh, but you're not on time for work. So your performance practically has taken away your power and presence in their life. This is why we have to live a certain way. So that when God calls on us to be able to be his hands and feet, we have not already disqualified ourselves by bending to culture character. I'm preaching up here, y'all. He denies, I'm sorry to this man. <laughs> Verse 58, and a little later, someone else saw him and said, ain't you, what's your name? Ain't you one of them? But Peter said, man, stop talking to me. No, I'm not. And after about an hour, still another person insisted saying, certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, man, you better shut up talking to me. I don't know what you're talking about, but you about, I got a knife. <laughs> and immediately, while he was speaking, denying what he was committed to, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. At the moment he was doing it. I just want to make sure you know I see you in it. I, I just want to make sure when you lay down, you know I saw you. I just want to make sure you know. You don't have to hide this from me. I know. And this is so deep because Jesus told Peter before this happened, he said, this is what you're going to do. And he was so zealous with his commitment. He was like, there's no way. Me? p Rock, The same one you said? A, a, the church you about to build on me? Foundation? I'm solid, dog. I got you. JC. Peter for life, JCP, that's what, that's us. And he said, before the sun rises, you'll deny me how many times? Three times. And the rooster will crow. He denied him three times. He forgot about it. And then the rooster crows and Jesus looks directly at him. Watch the revelation. Remember the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, Peter, the rooster crows, to, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And because Jesus looked at him in the middle of his darkest moment, he responded by going away and weeping bitterly. This was the seed of condemnation. He knew Jesus saw him in the actual authenticity of his lie. In the middle of his mess. Smelling like everything he had been in. And instead of recognizing the love of God. He chose the lie of the enemy. Okay. So the cycle of condemnation. You're called by the Lord. 
you're committed and you learn that commitment by walking with it. You get confronted in life. And then if you believe the lie, you walk in condemnation. And I don't know what lie you've believed today. And I don't even know the lie that Peter believed. But at some moment, he believed a lie so much that it condemned him that he went away. He, watch this. He was already walking at a distance. He went further away. It said he went away weeping bitterly because his calling, commitment, and his confrontation made him come to a point where he made a decision and now he felt that he was condemned. And this, for me, is the part when he went away weeping bitterly. It's when I believe in Peter's life, the cloud of condemnation formed over his life. And this is something that for many of you is the same thing that's over your life right now. You have seen a situation and you made the wrong decision. And now it's caused you to think God no longer sees me how he used to see me. He sees me defined by the moment I had and the cloud of condemnation appears in our life. And it usually starts off really small. You know what? I'm just going to walk through life with this situation and I'm going to allow it to be something that's around me. But then I know it's always lurking, but then it comes and it begins to get over my life. And I walk behind this thing and everywhere I go and everybody that sees me, you know, there's something back there, but you can't see who I really am because I don't see who I really am. I don't know if I'm called to lead. I don't know if God still has a plan for me. I don't know if God is going to use me. I don't know if everything that is going on right now will ever change because I'm still walking under this cloud of condemnation. And the thing is, the longer you stay up under it, that's how people start to know you. Some people have never even met the real you. Because when they met you, you still were hidden behind the cloud of condemnation. They don't even know that you're a person of joy because you forgot you're a person of joy. They don't even know that you have a strong calling and you're prophetic and that God uses you in all kinds of situations. They don't even know. Why don't they know? It's because you're hidden behind the cloud of condemnation. Can I say it to you in a point? Condemnation always wants control of your life. It always wants control. The reason it comes into your life is because even if it's a sunny day, it wants you to feel like it's raining. <laughs> even when God blesses you, he wants you to feel like it's nothing compared to how he blessed them. And matter of fact, you probably shouldn't enjoy it. You shouldn't even celebrate it because you don't deserve it. Jesus. Some of y'all, God has blessed you so much and you have still not accepted the favor and goodness of God over your life because you're walking under the cloud of condemnation. And the enemy is playing you like a video game. Day after day, making you feel unworthy. There's job positions you should have applied for and you have all of the credentials and all of the skills, but you won't even fill out the application because you feel like somewhere along the way, you did something that was too bad to deserve an opportunity like that. What if I fail? What if I mess up? What if I succeed should be your idea? What if God is with me? What if God allows the windows of heaven to open and a blessing be poured out that I don't have room enough to receive? That's my right as a child of God. But when the cloud of condemnation comes over my life, I walk with this thing everywhere. I'm writing a book right now, and uh, I'm, I'm working on helping people walk through damage. I feel like God's called me to bust open this myth and lie that people that God uses at a high level somehow came out perfect. And I, I want to use everything. When the spit hit the fan earlier this year, 
when God healed me of that moment, he said, Michael, now I want you to use it in real time. I want you to tell this story, all of the next book you write, I want you to use it, not 15 years from now. I want you to get up and I want you to share what I did for you in taking all the damaged areas of your life from childhood all the way to now and I've used it for your destiny. He told me the value is still in you. Even though people may think you're damaged goods, the content on the inside of you is still good. And if you would put it in the hands of a master, y'all, I'm going to preach this thing. That I would take every damaged thing and turn it into something that would be for your destiny. So I've been writing this book. And the spirit of condemnation tried to come over me as we started writing this book. How in the world are you about to share the real of everything that's happened to you and with you and you've decided to do? And God began to say, Michael, I called you to do this. Because there is no freedom if there is no truth. I'm going to say it again. You cannot think that you're going to actually be free and there are still secrets. Freedom only flourishes in truth. So right out the gate in the second chapter, I talk about how I was physically abused at age six or seven by a neighborhood boy. Quiet. Because this is happening in black communities everywhere. I know nobody says it. I know nobody, just a boy in the neighborhood, awakened things that were never supposed to, and I knew it was wrong, had no language. It happened to me. It, it, wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't something I went seeking out. But at that moment, the cloud of condemnation started to form over my life. And what happened from that point? It was something that I repressed so deep that I didn't even remember it until four years ago. I haven't told nobody about it. Literally, we were in the middle of a series called Damaged Goods. And I was asking all the people, just go back in your memory. And remember the things that God's delivered you from. Just dumb up here. <laughs> and I just want you to think about it and just ask the Holy Spirit to bring it back to your memory. And bring it to the feet of the master. <laughs> and I was in here one day. And the sound man was playing worship music. And the Holy Spirit, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. And I got overwhelmed and I started crying. And all I knew to do was either to hide or heal. There was, I was already the pastor of the church. <laughs> oh, y'all thought this happened before the ordination so I can make sure that I'm a man of God that's worthy of... The, no, 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 no. God says, I'll, I'll, I'll heal you in layers. I'll, do, I'll keep doing the work. If you would just let me do it, I'll keep doing the work. I'm the pastor of the church sitting right here at the altar. I literally canceled the rest of my day and I had to run to the arms of my wife and fearful, not knowing how she would judge me. This happened to me, but, but I don't know now that I'm carrying this and I'm thinking I'm crying. I said, now I got something to tell you. She's like, what baby? And I told her what happened. And in that moment, God used my wife as an extension of God's love on this earth towards me. And she said only three words. It's not, four words, it's not your fault. And when she said it's not your fault, it was like a dam broke on the inside of me. And I wept at 31 years old like a, like a six-year-old. Because from the point of offense... All the way until the spirit of condemnation was broken. Yeah. 
It had been stored up with all of these emotions that the enemy still had. Now I know why I was addicted to pornography. Now I know why I was chasing these feelings. Now I know why. why. It's because that spirit of condemnation said, you got to prove that you're not gay. You got to prove that something's not wrong. You got to prove. I'm saying stuff ain't nobody going to say. But I'm going to tell you this whole thing. And as God began to break that thing, I feel the presence of God right now. As he began to break that thing up off of me, freedom came to my life. And I realized I wasn't damaged, I was made for destiny. I realized that if the enemy can't shut me up, he gonna tear this whole thing up with my testimony. I am a living witness of the goodness of God. Condemnation tried to control me, but I found Christ. And whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Until we get this real in the church, people are going to be living these fake bound cuffed lives. If I got to go first, And if I got to sacrifice the platform to tell the truth, I don't care. Today, I'm free. (laughs) Oh, I felt that thing. Today, I'm free. You can't tell me nothing. I ain't told you. I'm free. It must be exhausting to continue to live hiding. See, the reason I got to confront this thing of condemnation condemnation is condemnation is the deepest root. (laughs) It's the deepest root that brings up fruit that's negative in our life. Like all of the fruit that we see, we try to deal with that. But but condemnation (laughs) is deeper than what your physical body is dealing with. So scientists now are saying that so many diseases and so many things are, are, are connected to stress. But stress is still not the deepest root of where our pain in humanity comes from. It's spiritual. Can I show you a picture real quick? And we got to get out of here. Put, put, up, put up the root of condemnation. I, I, I hope when you see this, it never leaves your mind because it changed my life. This is the root of condemnation. If you can see at the top, all of the leaves are dying. And can you put up what those are? See, these are the leaves of our life. Sickness, broken marriage, poverty. Everything on top of the surface that we see is always attached to a root. And what the church does many times is we start cutting the leaves. Hoping that better ones will grow back. (laughs) We go to different churches. Hoping that the environment will help us. We move to a different city. We stop following certain people and following other people. But you never addressed the root. So it's always coming back. But but even when you go to the root system, put the first one down there. Everything that happens, this is where science ends. They say it's because of stress. That's why we got calming apps. Take 15 seconds and breathe. Two more times. And we're just breathing. But even getting healthy doesn't heal your soul. Your physical health will not confront the traumas that happened to you as a child. So, so, so where science ends, they, they've started... To look at the Bible, and the Bible says something that there's a deeper root than stress. Guess what it is? Fear. And, 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 and they're saying that all of these things, poverty, sickness, depression, anxiety, all of that stuff is formed by stress. But stress is a response to fear. Fear of the future. Fear of failure. Fear of not being good enough. 
And do you know what the root of fear is? Put it on there. Condemnation. This is the big root. It's the tap root, dad said. It's that thing, if we pull this up, fear can't live. (laughs) Stress can't live. Poverty, brokenness, anxiety, depression, it can't live. What I'm telling you right now is this thing of condemnation was the first thing that the enemy tried to tempt Adam and Eve with. Remember what it was. Put this back up. Keep it up there. I want you to see all of their symptoms came because God said, you messed up. You walked out of my thing. Now you're going to have stress. You're going to have to work. And I never meant for you to have stress. I meant for everything to be provided for you. But why did stress come into the picture? It's because they exhibited fear and they hid when they should have brought it to God. Do y'all remember? When they messed up, when they made a mistake, it didn't change their identity. It was an event, not their identity. But they believed the lie of the enemy. So what did they do? In fear, they went and hid. Maybe Jesus won't see the only two humans on the earth. And they became fashion designers and made swim trunks and bikinis for the first time out of leaves. But why did they do that? The fear was because of condemnation. They thought God was trying to keep something from them instead of keep them for something. So they believed the lie. If you eat this fruit, it's always counterfeit. He don't want you to know something that he knows. And as soon as they bit the fruit, condemnation, fear, stress, and all of the sicknesses we have in this world. What I'm telling you is when you're, everybody say in Christ. Christ. You don't have to live like this. You have another choice. Peter had another choice. When Jesus looked at him, he could have ran to Jesus and said, I messed up. I'm sorry. Forgive me. But he believed the lie of the enemy and ran away from him. And guess what Peter went to do? Can you guess? What was he doing when Jesus found him? Guess what he went to do? He went back to what was comfortable. Can I say it to you in a point? Condemnation always pushes you to what is comfortable. He spent three years now walking with Jesus, learned all kinds of skills. But guess what he went back to? The place where Jesus found him. If you live in condemnation when you go away from God, you don't go to better places. You go back to the place that you were in when God came and found you. You go be comfortable in gossip. You're comfortable in sex. You're comfortable in being shysty at business. You're comfortable at being passive. Whatever you were doing before Christ, that's your default setting. You know when you're playing a video game and you die and it makes you start over again? That's where we go when we believe the lie of condemnation. Peter goes back fishing in John 21. And it says, Jesus dies rises and he comes back to encourage his disciples i'm giving you a lot of bible right here but in john 21 verse 1 it says later jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the sea of galilee he went to the place where peter found himself comfortable isn't it amazing that god in his grace will come find you This is how it happened. Several disciples were there. Simon, Peter, Thomas, nicknamed the twin. Nathaniel from Canaan and Galilee. They're all there. And Simon, verse 3, I just want you to see it. Simon said, I'm going fishing. I'm going to cuff back to what is comfortable. Keep preaching, Pastor Mike. But I have this cloud of condemnation over me, so I'm going back to the drink. I'm going back to the relationship. I'm going back to the weed. I'm going back to the pills. I'm going back to lying. I'm going back to hiding. I'm going back to ice cream. I'm going back to what is comfortable. Jesus calls out and he says, oh, yeah, y'all, y'all doing that net thing again? How's it going for you? You've gone back to what's common? 
without me? How's it going? Verse 7, it says, Then the disciples caught a bunch of fish, and the miracle happened again. And it says, Then the disciples, Jesus loved, said to Peter, It's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic, for he was, he was stripped for work, and he jumped into the water and headed to the shore. Hold on, what? They on the boat, doing what's common. They catch no fish again. It's a repeat of where Jesus found him. That's why we got to read so much more of the Bible, y'all. Because there's patterns. The same exact scenario. You will find yourself in the same exact scenario. So that God can prove to you from that spot. He can still use you. They're up there casting their nets, not catching anything. Jesus says, casting on the other side again. Rerun. Miracle happens again. And this is how Peter knows it's Jesus. I've seen this before. That's Jesus. And instead of going away, I did that one time before. I'm going to run towards him, even if it costs me something. It doesn't say he rose to shore. The, it says the baby was out there with his chest out. I don't even understand this. He put on his clothes to jump in the water. He wasn't even these. Oh, I got another opportunity. Let me just. Like he just, he don't. Because when I have another chance to get it right with Jesus, I'm not going to run away. I'm going to do everything I have to do. And this man runs to Jesus. Oh, I love it. Jesus makes breakfast on the beach for him. This is what, this is what the Bible said. And then he asked Peter a question. I need you to tune in just right here. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? What did he ask him? Do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know I love you. Then feed my lambs. How he know he love them? Because the last moment they connected, the last moment I saw you, you had believed a lie. So I'm now accepting your love but the last moment was a lie. You're still asking me about love when the last time you saw me, I was caught in a lie. I'm saying it over and over slowly until it hits you. God will ask you about love even when he caught you in a lie. Okay, just stay with me. Yes, Lord, Peter replied. You know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus, I got another question for you, Peter. Do you love me? He asked him the same question. Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know, I love you. He says, okay, so take care of my sheep. And a third time, he asked Simon, son of John, do you ask me a different question, Jesus? I told you, I love you. Peter, watch this, watch this, was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. When I begin to look at how many times that Jesus asked, do you love me? One, two, three. It was the exact number of times that Peter denied him. One, two, three. He was not asking for information. He was trying to give Peter and all of us a revelation that every lie can be replaced with love. That one, two, three. God said one, two, three. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. He said, there's no lie you believe that I don't have enough love to cover. Some of y'all should be rejoicing. 
He was hurt over what was healing him. <laughs> it was Peter's opportunity to receive the love and replace the lie. All God was trying to do was give an opportunity to every time he lied, replace it with love. Let me just say it in a point. How do you break the cycle of condemnation? With love. Condemnation is fueled by a lie. Conviction is fueled by love. So, 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 so Pastor Mike, you just telling us to go do whatever we want to do and da-da-da-da. No, you missed it. When you're called by the Lord and you learn commitment and you face confrontations in life, if you believe the love of God, when you mess up, you're convicted, not condemned. When Peter and Jesus locked eyes, it was not for condemnation. If he would have believed that Jesus really loved him, he would have been convicted. And the Holy Spirit convicts us so that we will make right decisions for what we already committed to so that we can fulfill our calling. It's one big circle. But if at any moment you believe the lie where there's supposed to be conviction, the enemy will convince you of condemnation. So today, what are you saying to me, Pastor Mike? In Christ, we were never supposed to experience condemnation. Ever. But we are supposed to experience conviction. When Jesus looked at Peter, he was supposed to be convicted. That's why Romans 8 verse 1 says, so now, look at this, chapter 8 verse 1. This is how to live a life in the spirit. So now, there is no condemnation. Everybody say now. No condemnation. no condemnation say it again now, now. No, condemnation. no condemnation I don't care what you believe before but in Christ now, now. No, condemnation. no condemnation so now there is no condemnation for those who belong by faith to Christ Jesus and because you belong to him the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin. The reason the enemy don't want to get you to get this. Because sin in most of your life is the most powerful force. It's not the spirit. Sin has more control over your actions than the spirit does. And God's saying how do you make sin powerless? You believe there's no more condemnation for those people who are in Christ Jesus. Because the power of the light giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature, because of this humanity. It says, so now, so God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sins, control, over us by giving his son as a sacrifice. Remember we're talking about the blood of Jesus? This is where it comes in right here. It was a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow. Uh, we no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead... We follow who? The Spirit. I thought about it. How many times did Peter deny Jesus? Help me. How many times did he deny Jesus? Three. How many times did Jesus ask Peter, do you love me? Three. How many days did it take him to defeat death, hell, and the grave? It, it was almost if. He said, you know what? I'm going to put an end to this condemnation thing forever. 
And it's going to take me three days to defeat death, hell, and the grave. Everything we're scared of, fearful of. But I've not given you a spirit of fear. But I've given you a spirit of power, love, and self-discipline, one translation says. Jesus conquering the grave produce the grace for your greatest mistakes those three days conquering death hell and the grave it produced the grace we would all need to be able to live this life and still make mistakes that's why romans 5 20 says moreover the law entered that the offense might abound but where sin abounds somebody shout at me grace Say grace. grace. That's the unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor and kindness of God. Somebody say grace. grace. Where sin abounds. One, two, three. Grace much more abounds. One, two, three, four, five. Pastor Mike, give me a practical step to this. I'm so glad you asked for that. After we've been in this sermon for an hour and 35 minutes, let me tell you. You watch movies this long all the time and it don't help you. (laughs) It actually makes you more condemned (laughs) because you think you should be living that life. And God said, I have a better life if you would be content. Okay. Let me give you a practical tool. When I was uncuffing from the spirit of condemnation, something that God told me to do a lot is take communion. And I was like, what? He said, you, you, you got to understand that the practice, write this down, of communion conquers condemnation. Could you bring out my example real quick? It said in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four. most of us miss the reason why we do communion. You think it's a ritual. It's not something that we do as a ritual. I'm going to prove it to you. He sits the disciples down and he said, I know y'all going to have to still live on this earth. And you're going to mess up and make mistakes. So I'm going to give you a practical practice that you can do every single day. If you want, not when the church calls it, not when you have the little cups and the wafers and the grape juice and the little styrofoam. I don't know how they think that's bread, but it is a styrofoam cup, like a little skinny styrofoam you'd be having us eating. He said, but... But as often as you do this, read, everybody say, remember. Remember. So when I'm feeling condemned, I need to remember what Christ has done for me. When I made the mistake, I need to remember my identity in Christ. I'm a joint heir with Christ Jesus. I am the righteousness of Christ. When I'm doing the wrong thing and I've gotten to a pattern, I need to remember the promises of God that he has a plan for me, not to harm me, but to prosper me. And Jesus said, I need you to, everybody say, remember. First Corinthians eleven twenty four. 24, he says, and he gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke some bread into pieces and he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let me put it in a point. Communion is not a ritual. It's a reminder. Ooh, that's nasty. And church has made it a tradition. Yo, you not holy. What's wrong with you? It's communion. Let me come out. People took something that God used as as simple as a, 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 what are they going to do all the time? What are they going to do? What are they going to do? Eat. So since they need to eat all the time, let me give them a simple reminder. When condemnation tries to come and find them, yeah. probably three times a day, that three, something is... Father, Son, Holy Spirit, every time I sit down to eat, I I can remind myself I don't have to live under condemnation because any man that be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. And behold, aha, abracadabra, everything has been made new. So let me demystify communion for you. 
I need you to know if you just got baguettes at your house and big pieces of bread before you sit down and eat this week, I want you to break some bread and remember Christ being whipped 39 times and taking lashes and being nailed to a cross. His body was broken for you. And I want you to take some grape juice. Welch's, my favorite. And I want you to take it. And I want you to remember his blood that was poured out for every one of your sins. So you do not have to live in condemnation. Now, this is how some of the older saints like to take communion. But can I also tell you what God honors? French fries. And a Coke. Oh, and a McDouble. I ain't had you in about a year and a half. <laughs> You can literally take this, and I know some of y'all, that's sacrilegious. It's not about the ritual. It's about remembering. God, as I break this fry, see y'all, some of y'all so churchy. God, at this moment, I made a mistake this week. And God, as I break this fry, I'm remember your body broken from me. God, as I break this pretzel, God, I remember your body broken from me. As I remember this Gatorade, as I'm a soccer mom and I'm taking it, and you can be in the middle of the field serving your children and feeling like nothing. And God says, take that pretzel out of that 99 cent bag and break it and remember my body. And take that Gatorade and take a sip and remember I quenched the thirst you would have for the rest of your life. Take the Oreo. Some of y'all would take communion every day. <laughs> but break it and remember his body. Take the milk, pour it. It's not the ritual, it's what? Remembering. I've I've taken a Rice Krispie treat before. It's been years. Eight months. <laughs> There's only freedom and truth, okay, okay. When the enemy tried to remind me of what I did, I'd reminded him of whose I was. And I defeated condemnation with the simple spiritual act of communion. What are you saying to me, Pastor Mike? Some of y'all need to be taking communion every day. That cloud of condemnation has been so over you that you literally cannot remember the last time you felt chosen, loved, regarded by God. And today he says, I haven't changed. My love for you haven't changed. Your ability to remember what I did for you has. So take communion. And as often as you, he didn't say every Sunday. He didn't say with your small group or your church. He said, as often as you need this, do this in remembrance of me. And I'm telling you, you want to break the back of condemnation in your life? Remember what Christ has done. Somebody ought to give God a shout of praise in this building. Oh, come on. If you're going to remember what Christ has done for you. It's over. What uncuffs you from the lie of condemnation? The love of Christ. If you're going to be uncuffed. Because some of y'all, we can keep doing the series for the next 10 weeks. And you wouldn't be able to receive any of the promises of God. Because you still think that you're not worthy. But somebody say, in Christ. In Christ. When, you get your, when you get your life in Christ, he uncuffs you from condemnation. The only way you live in it is you choose to link back up with it. So, Pastor Mike, can you put that wheel back up there real quick? Uh, what are you saying to me? And what you do at that last part is going to determine how you live your life. You are called. Somebody say, I am called. I am called. And somebody say, I'm learning, I'm learning commitment. Life will confront, will confront. But, I will love. but I will believe love. 
Because when you believe love, condemnation can't come in. When I believe love, conviction will come in. It'll change you and make you feel like, oh, messed up, need to change some things, need to submit myself, need to get more accountability. I need to do this. But it happened, but I'm not it. I did it. But I'm not it. What are you saying, Pastor Mike? Replace the lie with love. If you don't take anything from this, replace the lie with love. Today, God, I I did my best to communicate your love to your people. And I'm asking right now that you would wash over your people. And there would be no more bondage. That the chains would be broken over people, Father God. I'm just believing right now. Yeah, I feel the presence coming and invading the lies right now. Come on, just right now, lift your hands up because there's no more bondage. I feel like God is about to break chains over your life. He's uncuffing you right now. He's uncuffing you from the lies you believe, the condemnation you've been living under, that cloud that has kept you weighted down. Right now, God is breaking the chains. He's now removing the stains. He's now removing removing the shame he's now removing the pain father right now we are declaring there is no more bondage father that every chain is broken father God that whom the sun sets free is free indeed God let us believe the love that you shared with us through Jesus Christ and no longer believe the lie Heal us from the inside out. I feel the presence of God. Somebody just lift your hands and say, Holy Spirit, work on me. Yep, yep. Because right now you got to give him permission. Right now he's going to start doing things on the inside of you that are going to change the light of love. You're going to feel joy again. You're going to be able to get the the ability to come out of laziness and being lethargic. And you're going to have passion again. God is renewing, restoring, and redeeming. Said there is no bondage. Every chain is broken. There is no bond. Receive this over you right now. Jesus saw. Said no guilt and no shame. Woo! All my stains in and there is it's happening sing that again just lift it up in worship and there is no yeah it's happening right now all over the world come on somebody say ever he's uncuffing you right now from everything that has tried to condemn you the divorce the mistake the thing you did on purpose he said when you're in Christ he said I'll take all of that there's no guilt and no shame hey send this yeah something's happening y'all come out here let's sing this just a couple more times just lift that up come on lift your hands lift your voice and say there is no bondage something is happening the presence of God is washing over you. Receive the love of God. Said there is no. Receive the love of God. Jesus, Believe this. He took guilt and shame on the cross for every one of our mistakes. Believe what Jesus did for us. No been a cloud of condemnation over your life 
and you want that chain broken or you want to be uncuffed right now, hands lifted right now all over the world in this room right now. I'm about to pray for you. And by faith, there is something about to shift in your mind and your heart. You are not what you did. You are not what happened. You, it was your fault, but you are not a failure. God is about to redeem and, and restore. And every damaged area, he's going to use it for your destiny. If you would bring it to the king, Father, in the name of Jesus. I pray for every person that has been living under the lie of condemnation and by your spirit today I thank you for a revelation that changes infuses love where there has been a lie we curse the lie father God that has come even to some of us since a young age father I declare that the truth of your word is that we are redeemed that we are restored that we are righteous not by our performance but by our position God I thank you that the bondage of condemnation is broken over your people today and I declare that we would never confuse conviction and condemnation another day in our life give us the proper view of you you're not a God that came to punish us but you're a God that came to discipline us so that we can be disciples and see everybody come to you. God, I thank you that there's nothing you wouldn't do to get to us right now, Father God. I thank you that your love is overwhelming us. Yep, even as tears are flowing, even as you're remembering things from the past, God is saying there is nothing. There's no shadow. Yeah, he's coming after you, coming after me. He loves you that much. Somebody say, there's no wall you won't kick down. He's tearing down the lies, coming after me. Come on, somebody say that again. There's no shadow you won't light Let your love wash over us, God. Let us believe, Father God. Like never before, God, we thank you for your love. coming after you today oh, oh I feel the presence of God and leave the I don't understand I don't deserve it, I don't deserve it. still you give yourself away you've never accepted Jesus and his reckless love for you today I want to give you the opportunity to no longer live cuffed to condemnation I want you to live in communion with Christ that's what Peter had on that beach he said he had common union with Jesus he remembered where Jesus found him and how much grace was extended to him from his business all the way to his life and today God's saying would you let me commune with you come into common union and would you receive this love I have for you in just a moment we're going to pray and I believe that there are people that are uncuffing from condemnation but you cannot do it without being in Christ any man who is in Christ he's a new creation Doing this without Christ is going to come up with an empty catch. Today I'm asking you, do it God's way according to Romans 10, 9. He said, all you have to do is believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he died from you and repent. That all that means is turn. I was fishing on this side of the boat. Jesus said, turn, fish on this side of the boat. When you repent, that's when the miracle happens. And today, I just want to give you the opportunity to accept the love of God. And I don't know what denomination you came from or what your big mama told you or what you watched on some televangelist TV, but God is in love with you. 
There's no wall he won't kick down, no mountain he won't climb up. He been trying to get your attention for years. You just good with the cutoff game. Your cutoff game is real good. But God, God won't stop pursuing you. And today is just another opportunity. And may I submit to you, today is the day of salvation. <laughs> this is the greatest decision you could ever make. It took me from being a liar, a manipulator, somebody who was addicted to pornography, somebody who dealt with trauma and abuse in God. When I gave it to him, he took all my damage and he wrapped it up into something that I get to share with you every day. It's part of my destiny now. I'm free because I found Jesus. I don't want you to live cuffed or bound another day. So today, would you accept the free gift of salvation? And the thing I love about it is it's free so that nobody's works could pay for this. Nobody being born to the right family. If you're a right skin color, if you're Democrat or Republican, it don't matter. He said, this is the free gift of God to every person. So I'm sorry that people tried to make you pay for what God made free. But today I'm, I'm offering you the free gift of salvation and all the payment required is faith. So today on the count of three, if you're saying, Pastor, I want to be included in that prayer. I want to receive grace through Jesus Christ so I no longer live with the cloud of condemnation I just want you to lift your hand on the count of three one you're making the greatest decision of your life two I'm proud of you but more than that your name will be written in the Lamb's book of life and you will start a journey with Christ that is going to transform you forever three just shoot your hand up all across the world yeah there are people everywhere I don't care if you're watching this on rebroadcast or if you're in the room right now. God said today, right now, this moment. Somebody say now. now. He's changing the spirit of condemnation that's been over you. And you're adopted into his family. You're a son. You're a daughter. Your identity is changing. At TC, we're a family. Nobody prays alone. So y'all, for the benefit of all those who just gave their life to Christ, I want us to pray this prayer together. Everybody say, God. Thank you for sending Jesus for the final payment for all my sin. Today, I receive the grace of God. Today, I believe the grace of God. And today, I surrender. I believe you lived you died and you rose again with all power just for me I give you my life change me renew me transform me I'm yours in Jesus name amen can we give God praise oh transformation church I need y'all to turn up all over this place Replace the lie with love. Tomorrow when the enemy tries to convince you, that didn't mean nothing. You just was emotional. Say, shut up, devil. Matter of fact, shut the hell up. Literally like, shut the hell up. Okay, shut the hell up. I'm a new creation. My identity is in Christ. I'm learning how to be committed. But I am going to see what the end of this call journey looks like. If you just made that decision, would you text SAVED to the number on the screen? And we want to help you. We want to give you some information. This, this is one of the moments that change people's life forever. And I know there's thousands of people watching this. And I just want to say this to you. This will be your best year ever if it is your best year spiritually. We're almost at the halfway point of 2022. And your report of how this year was could be completely different by the decisions you make to uncuff today. So I'm challenging you. If you haven't watched all of the, the, the uh, weeks of this series, go back and watch one through five. Because next week, 
I'm for real. I'm I'm teaching a message on gluttony next week. It's called cuff to cake. Oh, I'm I'm when I tell you I'm coming for all of us, me included. I'm coming. Don't watch tomorrow and have anything planned the next day, cause we all gonna be fasting. I, all I really want to do is help us. Either the word works or it doesn't. I'm not gonna live my whole life being out here faking some Christian life. I want to help us be convicted to move forward. God is really doing deliverance in all of us. I'm going to ask you a favor. Would you send this message to four people this week? No, 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 no. Their life depends on it. They've never seen somebody from a platform like this give just one, two, three. Like, this is the most concise ministry of the gospel that I think I've done in all my years of ministry. It, it, you can get everything from this message. So I'm asking you, would you share it with how many people did I say? Maybe I like the other one, three. Just give me three. Now, if you want to be extra credit, say over 15. But at least three. I believe God's going to do something strong and strategic through your invitation to transformation. Father, thank you. Thank you for meeting us here this week. Thank you that we no longer have to live under the cloud of condemnation, but we are free in you. When the liar comes to lie, let us remember the truth of your love. And Father, let us extend grace to other people the same way we need it. Bless us until we meet again, Father God. And I thank you that there's a hedge of protection. I pray a special hedge of protection over everyone traveling. I pray a hedge of protection of these children getting out of school. I pray a hedge of protection, Father God, for every person. Father, in that day, Father, if they are a part of Transformation Church, Transformation Nation, God, I just thank you. That I, just, I, just, I, I, I send warring and ministering angels out on the, our church's behalf, Father God. Keep us from things we don't even know you're keeping us from, Father God. Keep us in, 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 in focused on you, Father. I thank you that we will not let our comfort forfeit our calling. And we will no longer things that, love things that don't love us back. We trust you, we believe you, and we're uncuffing. In Jesus' name, we agree. We expect. Amen. Will you give God some praise? Go out and live a transformed life. I love y'all.